All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to close our executive session and open the public meeting. This is the Tuesday, January 24th, 2023, uh, Port of Bellingham Commissioner's meeting. Uh, roll call, starting with Commissioner Briscoe. Here. Commissioner Bell. Here. And Commissioner Shepard is here as well. I'm gonna start with our advisory meeting schedules. And before I do that, I'll just wish a, a happy Lunar New Year to everyone celebrating. If you're like my family, we celebrated Lunar New Year over the weekend and uh, happy uh, New Year to those who celebrate. Our advisory committee schedules. Marine Advisory Committee, or the MAC, February 14th, 6 p.m. at the Harbor Center building right here. That's an in-person meeting. We have the Bellingham International Advisory Committee, or the BIAC. That's April 13th, 4 p.m., and that is a Zoom-only meeting. Next up is public comment. Carrie, do we have anyone signed up? We do not. Hello, friends on Zoom. If anyone there is wanting to make a public comment, 
Let yourself be known. Call me Ports. Looks like. Hey, Justin. <laughs> okay, looks like um, no public comment uh, at this time, so we'll go ahead and move on to our consent agenda. Motion to approve consent agenda items A through C. All right, any questions or comments for you, Commissioner Briscoe? I have none. Um, Commissioner Bell, I don't have any either. It's fairly short, so we'll go ahead and vote. Motion to approve consent agenda items A through C. Commissioner Briscoe? Yes. Commissioner Bell? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Carries 3-0. We'll move on to our first and only presentation of the day on Marina's Rules and Regulations and Tiffany DeSimone. Carrie set me up so I didn't have to stumble along on the share screen, so thank you. <laughs> Tiffany DeSimone, Director of Marina's. So good afternoon. I have for you today a presentation. We're not um, asking for any action today. We'll come forward um, in, a, in, a, in a near future meeting, um, but just presenting everything to you for rules and regulations for 2023. Um, so historically, this is just a housekeeping document mostly, and it's annually approved by the commission. Last year, we didn't propose any changes, uh, so it was pr approved on the consent agenda in January. Too loud. Um, uh, so in the interim, we do have some proposed changes for this year. What we heard uh, s several times over the last year from commission is a few things, are a few things. One is please move the wait list along in our marinas. Um, two, fix the excessive storage we have in our parking lots. And three, address derelict and non-seaworthy uh, vessel, vessels that are um, taking up more spots in our harbors. And so we believe that some of these proposed changes uh, establish some policies that will allow us to do that. Um, we have brought this, same, you've seen this uh, presentation. I've sent it to you an email. We've also brought it to two MAC meetings, one in November and one in January. So this is just part of that outreach uh, in the interest of transparency. So I will begin. The first uh, few are literally housekeeping items, so there's no policy change, and then I'll get into the, the meat of the proposed policy changes. Maybe. Okay. So the red text uh, identifies new policy language and rates and the green strikeout font is uh, language we propose deleting. Um, the first one is housekeeping definitions. We've added an acronym to our active commercial fishing vessel definition and then we've added new definitions for permanent moorage and sub lessee just to try to take out any ambiguity. Um, this one, again, housekeeping, just updating the uh, resolution identifier. Please stop me at any point if you have questions or you can ask at the end. Um, this one is no policy change. We're just cleaning up the language. It's the same, same uh, policy. And it's regarding our uh, months of moorage and when you can sublease. Uh, same thing here. Just adding clarity in the language, no change. Um, this, uh, oh yes, we're asking, sorry, I can't see, because I have this in the way. Can I move that? Yeah. Um, this section, we're asking to strike out the word two. Uh, we currently, by this definition, have used gates eight and gate six um, for tidal dependent moorage. We have most recently, depending on skill and tides, been able to get people into gate 12, so we're trying to use the, face, the, the space pretty efficiently. So we're just clarifying that we'd like to use some additional space for moorage if it's available. Um, clarifying language for um, more customers offer to slip from the wait list will be eligible to sublease their slip after a minimum of six months of moorage. Um, and again, we're clarifying that. Uh, 
Okay, transient mortgage. This is currently already language that is in the uh, policy, in the rules and regulations. We've just added it to an additional location for clarity for folks. It was just under the work doc section. Okay, now we're getting into the wait list. Um, so we propose a uh, language that says an applicant will be removed from the list if a slip offer is declined. Uh, you can see the way it used to be. We had a, we'll offer it to you. You can refuse, we'll offer it to you again. You can refuse. We believe this is partially of what slows down uh, getting people into slip, so. And then we're asking for our harbor master to have some discretion to open and close the wait list depending on uh, the activity for, for that. So Tiffany, mm -hmm. illuminate me on why people are refusing. If they're on the wait list and they're offered something, is it not the spot they're looking for? Or what, what's the rationale for refusing um, a spot that you're paying to be on this wait list and um, taking up space? Yeah, so a couple things. Um, first of all, Pam is here as my backup because she really knows this like the back of her hand, so if I miss something, she'll, she'll jump in. Um, but there are several, several reasons. I, the wait list is actually a moot point, which you'll see when we get to the birth change request list at this point in time, but there are many reasons. People don't have the boat yet, they've changed their mind, they're not ready to purchase yet, they're, they're waiting, I mean, there's a host of reasons, and they can be on more than one wait list at a time, because the wait list goes by slip size. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They sure can be. Yes, all of the above that you just said. So it sounds like you need to clean that up because you only got one list. Are we doing that in here? Uh, did we say? We didn't specify that on the um, waiting list. We, we specified it on the birth change request list, though. So on the birth change request list, we specified you only have one list? Two, we said. Two? Mm hmm. Two or three, we got one. Mm -hmm. Right. Do they get removed from both wait lists if they're offered they one They decline. Slip? So if they're on two wait lists, they're offered one spot, do they get removed from both? They get removed from the one that we've offered. Get removed. So the scenario would <clears throat> exist where they would not be able to buy a new bigger boat because we wouldn't have a bigger slip available. So they essentially what, what they're doing is hedging the bet so that they can, when that slip opens up, that's when they'll move to the bigger vessel. Otherwise, it, their timing has to be bang on. Spot on. But I can see where I wouldn't buy a boat unless I had a slip. Yeah, right. if I want to upgrade my boat, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna come to this harbor if I can't upgrade my boat from a right. 25 to a 40 I'm if I need it. Can't upgrade. What I was pointing out is. Is Oh no, this this envisions that you already have a boat. Well, but let's say I don't have a boat and I, well, I, you don't I, know what size it is. I, I want to get a boat and I'm like, okay, I'll get whatever size slip I need to get. I know it's I know it's full. I'm gonna be proactive mm -hmm. and get on there now. Yeah, if I hear it's a ten year wait and I know I wanna get a boat and I'm gonna get on that list now and then if you tell me I got a forty foot slip, I'll go get a forty foot boat. If you tell me I got a thirty five foot slip, I'll get a thirty five foot boat. So we certainly have people who approach it that way or people who approach it as my family who we bought the boat. Yeah. And so nothing Tiffany, prevents them from getting back on the wait list. No. It just, it's just going to move Correct. to the she bottom. Tiffany calls me up and says, I got a 40 foot slip for you. And I say, well, I'm not ready to buy a boat. Well, I'm out. We got to move you to the bottom so we can get through the wait go, list. Go get on the wait list again. Yeah. yeah that I mean, you, yeah. at that point, <laughs> you would have to pay to get on the wait list again. Am I correct? You would. And is there an annual fee for the wait list? Yes. Is that what I remember? Which we'll get to. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, it seems all right. Okay. 
always, always a confusing one in every a million options. Um, mortgage assignment, this is, uh, we are recommending rather than folks having to give us a 15 day notice for cancellation, a 30 day notice. Okay, this is a new section for subleasing. Um, we are recommending once a sub lessee enters into a sublease agreement, the agree agreement may not be canceled in order to obtain a more desirable sublease. If another sublease becomes available, the sub lessee can enter into a second sublease agreement for that slip, but must continue paying on the original sublease in, in addition to the, the uh, second. Oh, that was clear. <laughs> So what we have happening is you, you have a 40 foot boat, you can't get a slip, so you hop from sublease to sublease. So some, a three month sublease comes up, you say, yeah, I'll take it. Well, next month, a six month sublease comes up. Oh, I'm out of the three month, I want the six month. So we spend a whole bunch of time um, hopping people around, moving people around, opening and closing accounts, redoing. So this just makes people commit to the sublease that they've already signed for. Mm. So at the end of that three month sublease, they may be out of luck because there's not a six month available. Or they may need to look at the two month mark for something else and absorb some cost in order to have a longer sublease. And so all of these are really, as we take um, into account um, the market, so perhaps if we see slips emptying out in a recession or something, we'll need to come back and revisit and keep our eye on it, which we intend to do. In addition, we've begun our discussions with consultants for planning and design um, of the Inner Harbor renovation. And so we want to have a really good idea and feedback about what people are looking for. So that's part of the intent behind that. Was there any feedback from Mac on this item? I don't believe so. No, mm -mm. Do you think we have anybody on Mac who's involved in as a sublease? We do. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Um, the retainer, we're proposing to eliminate that. The retainer is if you have been a mortgage customer and you decide you would like to cancel mortgage, you can leave, you must leave for one year and then you come back at the top of the wait list. Uh, the birth, change request list. birth birth change request list because so you're a current customer. We're saying eliminate. We only have three people left on that, so we'll leave we'll leave those uh, there and work through them. But we'd like to not have that anymore. Okay, birth change request lists. So birth change request lists are current port customers, Marina's customers. So um, here's our proposal: mortgage customers are limited to placement on two lists. For each list, an annual fee will apply. And then we say a mortgage customer, mortgage customer may decline two slip offers and will be removed from the list on the third declined slip offer. This is for birth change request list. So this may be somebody who's in Blaine who wants to get to Squalicum or somebody who's at gate three that wants to get to gate 12. How many lists are there? A million. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> They're per slip size. Per for, harbor, per slip size. Yes. Per so gate? Why, no. Why, why two? Turn your, turn your mic on, Commissioner. Why are we giving them two declines? Why not just one? Because it simplifies it for us. We're wasting time waiting for them to make their mind up. I think we're offering some level of customer service to a current customer. Well, I, think we're, I think we're offering a level of customer service to offer them to be able to move. At all. Where they're at. Okay. We can sure take that recommendation and, and make the change in when we come forward. I just don't... It, it makes another person who wants to move into that slip wait that much longer while somebody's making up. Make your mind up if you want to move. If you don't want to move, stay where you're at. And go to the bottom of the list. Right. Okay. Why make somebody else wait for a spot that they want to move? I, I don't have the same heartburn with that. Um, 
But if you wanted to reduce it to two, that would make it kind of a split the baby approach. But I, because I do think it's a level of customer service if you want to come down to Squalicum and it, and it may just not be the right slip or you think you can, can get a better one. There's a, a there's host be of reasons people want different slips. There's going to be somebody fill that slip. It's not like it's going to go vacant. Currently, yes, that's correct. No, but they got a way to do it. That's what I'm saying is the person that's got first offer on that slip, well, how long, how long do they get no. to wait for until you ask them again? Well, we try to, right. I mean, we try to have good contact information and get in contact fairly quickly with folks within a week or so. Right. And then, Hi, Pam. If they decline Hi. that slip, then, so, so you, get, you get in touch. I want to make sure I got this clear. You yep. get in touch with them the first time. They decline that slip at that point in time. Then you're going to call them back later and ask them if they want to get into it again. Is that how I read this? Not into that same slip, into a different slip. Because somebody will have filled that. We will have so filled totally the other one. Slip. Okay, yeah. well, I thought you, yeah. were, you were calling them and letting them think about it for a while, then you'd call them no, again. No, no. no. different you slip. to the next person. Uh, yes. All right. Okay, all right, I, that's, that's fine. That's what I wanted to do is move to the next yeah. person. Yes. Go ahead, Pam. Um, I'd like to add, too, that on this birth change request Please, list, people... Uh, introduce yourself. So Pam Taft, Special Projects Administrator. For the Thank marinas, you. sorry. Um, <laughs> um, on the birth change request list, people can be as specific as the upward, um, downward, port ties, um, starboard tie. Um, so we won't offer them a slip unless it meets that specific criteria too. So we will skip over them. So when we do get to them, we are offering them what they are requesting. And so there. Oh, there is that. Thank you, Pam. This is a proposed change. We propose uh, for our loan slip, loan slip program, 30% of the visitor mortgage charges collected by the port for the use of the mortgage customer slip shall be credited to the mortgage customer's account with the port. That's if they're gonna be out for two weeks, they can sign up in our Harbor office and we can use that for visitor transient mortgage while they're gone. Okay, this addresses one of those points that I men mentioned earlier, which is people storing stuff in our open parking lots. Um, we're proposing parking of any trailer without a vessel is not permitted, with or without a vessel it is not permitted in parking lots unless authorized by, by the harbor master. And this forces folks to go in and face to face with the harbor master and for us to have make sure we have current contact information so that we can uh, monitor what's getting left in our parking lots. So for clarity, we may want to put boat trailer in there because you have several commercial guys that will drop a trailer off. It'll be there overnight or a day while they're, you know, doing stuff, the flat deck trailer, so to speak. Well, they can do that as long as they have permission, right? Yeah. They just need to go check in. Just one more thing you got to do in late afternoon or evening is go chase down the guy to tell me, I want to leave my trailer here overnight. I mean, I, I, I think we should specify it's a boat trailer. We don't want boats parked. This is what we're after, right? Boat trailers? Parking of any trailer other than a boat trailer? The, it's the specified goal. with or without a vessel, yeah. so. Isn't the goal to get rid of the trailers with old nets on them? It, it's it's um, intended to get rid of all of that, mm -hmm. so. Because we have dedicated. I think Commissioner Briscoe's point is we need some sort of short-term parking yeah, for a trailer. If I, if I bring down a, a, a net trailer, and swap, you know, I want to swap, but I'm not doing it that day or something. I want to, you know, it's going to sit there for a day before I do it. But you have it. You just need to get permission. You just need to go in and check in. You can still do it. You just need right, to walk I'm just in. I'm saying it's it, it, it's you can push back on that one, not just for me. Yeah, let me let me one extra step for people who are already busy getting a lot. Sure, I understand, and maybe it's a phone call, but let me wordsmith that a little bit. I know we're, I know we're yeah. talking about the derelict stuff, but that yep. doesn't yeah. cover that. We don't want to make it arduous for working people yep. to get their thing done. We I get hear it. that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is our proposed change to our visitor and transient mortgage rates and fees. You can see the, the changes. Here is the change proposal for the birth change request list and then the, the items that we've always, already talked about striking. 
Well, the power I'm gonna get to in the next slide. So here's the power rates. Um, so what we've essentially done is taken the electric service rates for Blaine and Squalicum and made the, them the same, $5 minimum, you can see all that. With the only difference being that Blaine will have a monthly utility fee of $4 a month. They, this will replace the $8 bi-monthly fee that is currently charged. So we have two different service providers. We have City of Blaine and we have Puget Sound Energy for Bellingham. So they charge us differently. So in Blaine, they charge the port whether the power is used or not. So that's why that, that additional fee in Blaine. Questions there? And then we are proposing um, an impound fee, which we currently do not have, and this is for, uh, obviously, for when we have customers who we impound multiple times. Does that cover your cost? <laughs> no, it does not. I knew the answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it isn't on this slide, but when we come back uh, for, with the action memo, we would like to say for a period of five years they can't return. And I could give you some, we've had multiple ones that we've impounded multiple times, so we'd like to get out of doing that. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. Is 50 bucks a painful enough fee to, to retard it the next time? Well, I think um, we always hope to collect on these. <laughs> oh yeah, then there's that. Yeah. <laughs> How much time do you spend collecting that? Mm -hmm. A significant amount. Yeah, I don't think the dollar amount's really any big deal when you get to that third time. It doesn't right. matter. It doesn't, matters, it doesn't so. matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. That is all that I have to present to you today. Can I answer any other questions? Commissioner Briscoe? I do have one. Can we back up to the power sure. fee and Blaine? That kind of yep. went past me real fast. Yeah, I know. It's confusing. One. Um, so... Every stall is going to get charged four dollars a month, whether they're plugged into the power box or not. Is that what I'm understanding? Correct. Okay. And currently, they get charged eight dollars every two months. Correct. So it's the same fee; it's just a different schedule of payment. Only if they're being billed power and they're plugged in, we have it built into our power rate, so it's it's charged automatically with the power. So the ones who are not using power are not being billed the eight dollars. They will be being billed the four dollars. Correct. So some people are going to see an increase even if they're not using power. Correct. Yes. Approximately what percentage of the folks are not using power? Ooh. That's one question I didn't anticipate. We <laughs> didn't anticipate that one. Um, I would think it has to be pretty low in the country you live in. I mean, most of these boats are using power. At least once a month. Yeah, what do you get? Most of them either got a heat lamp or a small something. heater or a light bulb or something going on. So I'm just trying to figure out how many complaints I'm going to get. I can I can get a, a roundabout number for you <laughs> to follow up. Be because the, the <laughs> question Rob asks is similar to the number of complaints I'm going to get. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. We'll try to provide you with the information. So, here's a question I would have trying to figure out exactly what he said. Is, uh, if there, is there is there power box got a lock? Out of the, is it got the tag on it? it? You can't use it till it's turned on. I don't believe they have them set Locked. up that way in Blaine. Okay, so every stall you can plug in and use power. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and if they th think that they're not going to use power and we don't have them set up for power, we will eventually catch them using power and then bill it to them. If yeah, well, that that was my concern is because we, we read the, the meters. Tags on them that you had to have taken off, um, and they would they would say, oh, well, you've got a tag on it. I don't have to pay. That's that would be a probably a, a legal thing, right? Mm -hmm. If you've got their power box locked and you're charging them for it, then I think there'd probably be an issue. But as long as it's, I've never really paid attention, mine's always open, so everybody plugs into it. So yeah, I'll, we'll take all of that feedback that we just heard, and when we come forward at the future meeting, we'll have answers for you. Anything else? That's it for me. Very well done, both of you. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Pam. One, I've got two two questions here. Okay. Is there anything in this that allows us to ex 
distract ourselves from having boathouses in plain. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing in our rules and regulations currently. Anything make it easier for us to no longer have boathouses? Can of gas and matches. <laughs> I don't have the answer to that. I'd have to think about it. I We're working that on a separate tract. Okay. Um, well, ultimately, it's good to, I appreciate the transparency here. It's good to make sure we have daylight on every change and go through it with minutia. So it's important work. Um, and uh, looks like uh, many that are very uh, reasonable and sensible. Thank you. Appreciate the direction. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd, uh, I'd like to thank Tiffany and Pam and Dave and all of our staff in the, in the marine waterfront areas. I've had numerous compliments since Tiffany took over the role of, of uh, director, and I know that that's due to the staff that helps hold her up. And from the, from the guys on the waterfront, thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Bell, did you have a question or you're done? No, I just can't imagine the number of personalities you have to deal with and juggling all of that. A masterful job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, hearing no other questions or comments, we'll move on to our action item. Authorize the executive director to execute an authorization to proceed for Harcourt's proposed projects number five and six within the waterfront district master development. All right, thanks, Gary. Uh, Brian Gowan, Director of Environmental and Planning Services. Let's see if I can get this started here. Last time I failed. I think I got this. Okay, looks like that's good to go. All right, thanks, Carrie. Um, yeah, so this action item that's before you is related to the ongoing development in the Waterfront District, um, and specifically Harcourt's uh, most current uh, proposed projects. Um, we are currently referring to them as projects five and six, which is under the master development agreement. This is the terminology, the, the, the numbering system that we've chosen. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of walk through these. It's the, the early phase of uh, project concept submittals, which is contemplated in the master development agreement, which uh, just as a reminder, uh, back in October of 2021, the Port and Harcourt revised the master development agreement to uh, do a number of things. But one of the primary steps was to revise the project approval process uh, steps. And I've talked about this a couple times, but just since we have one right in front of you, just as a reminder, um, and we've, we've emulated this in um, other waterfront district projects as well, which we'll, you'll see like at the board mill building and mill works and that as well. So the idea is to have a project concept design, be an iterative process with multiple design steps and approvals by the commission. First step is to um, review a project concept design, which is what's before you today for projects five and six. It's a high level, uh, just a, a review to show that it, the project meets with the master development agreement, the sub area plan, the typical design things that we had anticipated. It's not down into the specific very specific design details that's in future steps so um, pending commission approval of the of concept designs then we issue a notice or an authorization to proceed and usually a site access agreement which will allow them to go on the site and do some more detailed work they then will um, submit a land use planning uh, uh, and design review package to the city for review and then that'll go through a city process which is design review there's a neighborhood meeting a public meeting and um, and that process kind of goes through the city's uh, um, review. Pending, or once the, the city um, issues their land use um, approvals, then they'll come back to us with a more detailed design. Usually there's some changes that would come out of that process. And then the next level is the project development design submittal. That's really with some more engineering work done. That'll come to the commission again. Any changes that came out of the process will be reviewed. Pending commission approval of that, then it goes to, um, we'll, we'll create the parcel and they'll go into full on building permit applications. That's uh, another city process. Once they've got their final building permit, for the for the project then they'll come to us with a full project memo that has a detailed um, schedule for construction a detailed all the building permits that have been issued by the city and a fully financed project with proof of financing at that point then it'll be up to the Commission decide to sell the property to them based on that so it's designed to be iterative so there's no surprises when changes do happen uh, but just as a reminder this is you know the, this is the early first step of that are you going to walk us through the timeline of those next steps, particularly if you back up a slide? Yep. The 
project development design submittal when when do we anticipate that coming yeah so i will um and but just on this one just really quick so once we've issued this authorization to proceed pending commission approval then um, they have uh, i think 90 days to submit a full design package to the city the city's process is um, is what it is. You know, there's um, some some work there. Uh, they are short staffed too, and they've they've been projecting that their their permitting process is weeks behind schedule, and they're trying to be transparent about that. But they they're looking for ways to fix that as well. So we don't have a back end date of the city process. We tried to make it the things that we can control and that Harcourt control process and then they come back to us once that's done and then we do the next steps so I don't have firm dates for all that but um, this, this first step for them to get in a complete land use and permitting um, package it would be um, within um, 90 days of the authorization to proceed which after this action item we have that that prepared and we would plan on submitting that to them tomorrow so then that, that clock would start for them to get their design package into the city is the city review that initial review somewhere in the magnitude of six months yep that... six six to ten months kind of time frame right now it depends it, these projects are out of the shoreline jurisdiction so that helps with that time frame that just adds more time um, but this based on what we've had from experience um, they're probably six to ten months just right now and I'll should we talk about the projects three and four which are, are in that process right now um, and they um, they're we're expecting those permits here kind of in the next few months next two to three months so m most likely it would be kind of end of this year right like November December yeah probably not before October right yeah and uh, I've got I'll, I'll got a slide we can talk a little bit about kind of where we're at on that kind of review of their uh, compliance with the master's development agreement okay so those are the steps that are outlined. Here's this, this is the location, projects five and six. They're adjacent to the previously approved project three and four, which is on the, which we just kind of referred to, which is on the corner of Granary and Laurel. Um, project five and six, there was, there was a, a due date within the master development agreement for them to have submitted this um, project concept design by December 31st of 2022, which they did. They were actually um, had had it on their radar even a little bit more than I did. I was I, it was a they caught me by surprise a little bit, uh, but that's good. That means that they're they're tracking the MDA and full and trying to be in compliance with that. The project is uh, about two eighty five thousand square foot mixed use buildings um, on a shared podium just down Granary Avenue from projects three and four. I've got a couple other figures I'll show you here. Um, there are six story buildings. They do meet all of the kind of height restrictions, the view corridors, the sub area plan. I mean, based on staff, port staff review, looks like there are in compliance with what was anticipated, generally speaking. There's ground floor commercial on granary and then an internal um, parking uh, under the podium that would be accessed from the back street, which I'll show another slide there. The, the, the difference on this one, which all the buildings to date have been proposed along the arterials, so along Granary and Laurel, this is the first project that actually um, has frontage along a local street. So they are actually proposing um, ground floor residential along the local streets and a um, podium that's kind of pushed back. You can see how that, that's set back to kind of give a more pedestrian level feel on those local streets. So not having just a six story wall, they have two or three stories of these townhouses that, that come out on the street and then the, the, it pushes back a little bit for those other stories. So that's a design element that you've seen, you've seen um, in other areas that really works to help with that kind of pedestrian level scale. Um, and then they do have uh, additional public plazas and connections for pedestrian flow that, that butt up against projects three and four that fill out that um, interior um, plaza, as well as a connection um, through, the, through the two buildings or through the, the two projects um, and out through um, building between buildings B and C, which I'll show a slide that kind of gets out to the waterfront. So they are trying to show how that pedestrian flow can work with these projects, uh, plan projects, as well as the ones that um, are under construction now. There's about 144 residential apartment units uh, between the two projects. Um, like I said, there's um, local access from, the, from those interior roads, which is by design to kind of reduce the amount of traffic and, uh, and, and car focused, um, uh, less car focused, more of a pedestrian focus. Um, and all of these projects are compatible with our current location of the bike park and the container village. Uh, and I'll kind of go back to a, a map view that shows that this is outside of those, wouldn't, this won't impact those at all, or the existing parking that's uh, down on Granary right now. 
So uh, just again, a uh, review of the process, um, you know, pending commission approval to, um, of, the, of this, uh, we'll issue an uh, authorization to proceed and a site access agreement. They've got 90 days to submit their full package. That's a city-led process like we described. And then the, the staff is, though, um, port staff is continuing to monitor the master development agreement uh, compliance, including their construction schedule for the projects that are underway right now. Um, we've uh, you know, been providing commission updates kind of monthly on where they're at. They, um, they, they provide us a written update on those. They are signaling there's a couple months behind. Uh, we're uh, tracking that uh, and, and going to um, let them know that that's a, that's, that's a potential violation of the master development agreement. Uh, the schedule was, was highlighted a number of places that that's key. Um, but we, we also want to keep these moving forward so that we're not um, in any way slowing down the process um, while we're continuing to track compliance with the other issues. So with that, staff does recommend approval, but happy to have any discussion. Mr. Briscoe? We go back to the buildings. Yeah. So we've got... Uh, I'm assuming are all the apart residence units on the ground floor? There are on the, along the um, here. I can probably this is uh, this is a better probably view along um, Granary Avenue here, which is an arterial. This would be commercial commercial space along the frontage, which is required by the city. It doesn't have to be retail, but it can't be um, residential. Right. But then um, this street, which is not currently named, but we call it Maple Loop. And then this is Digester Way, which kind of goes back and kind of ends in the plaza behind the digesters, that they are proposing residential that you can kind of see these townhouses that come out onto the street. Okay. We've seen that in a number of places, Portland, and then, of course, on the East Coast, you know, it's more common. Um, and it is it actually does a nice element to kind of um, pr produce kind of a neighborhood feel rather than just a pure commercial district. And so that's that's by design. But that's where the residential um, areas would be along these more smaller local streets. And above that, the, the, three, flo what, the three floors, four floors? Yeah, and then this is all residential. Then it would be all residential. Yeah. All residential. Yeah. And there's a, they're behind, let's see if I can get another one. Um, yeah, you can kind of see it from here. So this would be the access off of Granary um, on what we call Maple Loop and then Digester Way. They have an entrance to their parking, which is a podium. They don't be going subsurface like they are in their current project. They'll actually be just building up a layer of, po of, of that. And then they'll have, so a portion of this, uh, this area will be elevated parking. And then they're, um, yeah, they, like I said, they have, they have four to five, depending on where exactly you're at, of, uh, of residential and commercial above that. And commercial. Yeah, on the frontage, on the commercial on the frontage along Granary. So you can see here kind of the footprint, how um, it fits with the existing uh, container village. Um, it allows us, would allow us to c continue to expand the container village, which we're talking about kind of coming out this way more. Um, the pump track in uh, this area doesn't, isn't impacted and the, and the parking, gr parking lot that we currently have. So it does make sense that that's a kind of the logical progression of the next set of projects. Um, and they do have a shared, shared podium with that adjacent buildings three and, uh, three and four. That's all the questions I have. Thank you, Brian. Yep. Commissioner Bell. Cover one eye already. Yeah, and I and I I can't blame COVID for my attitude today because I'm over it. So Holly, quick question: um, We're compelling Harcourt to do some things based on the master and spend money on things like this. Um, I, for one, am not a believer that they're going to make their time frame. Um, so everything that we compel them to do in the MDA, do we have potential liability exposure for the money they're spending? I would reframe that just a little bit, as lawyers are want to do. Um, when you say the port's compelling them to do things under the MDA, what's happening is Harcourt is complying with different steps under the MDA for the next project, the next project. So right now, by bringing forth the, the plans for project five and six, they're in compliance with the MDA, and the port's approval, uh, should the commission decide to do that, is in compliance with the MDA. Um, th we are intending on perhaps providing some communication to Harcourt about uh, the port's perspective on the timing on their other projects that are underway. Um, it's essentially kind of a you're going forward at your own risk um, situation because the, the document itself is, is fairly clear that time is of the essence for all of these various steps. 
uh, if Harcourt wanted to have a conversation with port staff about um, those existing projects or future projects, that's something that could, could happen. Um, but right now, the, the port needs to stay in compliance with the MDA, just like Harcourt needs to stay in compliance. So by providing those approvals for the future projects, um, I don't see a, a ground for Harcourt to come back later and say, wait a minute, you have forced our hand, we've had to continue designing these projects and spending money on these projects down the line beyond the ones that are currently under construction. And, and if the port were to say, hold on, time out, we're not going to approve five and six because we don't think you're going to hit the schedule for these other projects under construction, that would be an anticipatory breach um, and not something that would be recommended. So you, one of the things you said was that we are uh, indicating to them that they might be in violation. I would be a little stronger in, in that language and say that we don't believe that, that we do think that they're going to miss the target. Um, because I, I, for one, can't imagine them hitting the target um, and unless, you know, Louie can pull a rabbit out of a hat. And he's been known to do that, but I, I, I'm not a believer that that's going to happen. And my biggest fear is that there's a lot of money being spent. Um. You know, I would just echo what Holly said, though, in the sense that, you know, in October of uh, 2021, which isn't that far, far long ago, you know, this was the agreed upon set of projects that we all agreed on. And they're, you know, they, they, they submitted this to us on the time frame that they said they would. And, you know, we're not compelling them to do anything, really. It's more like they've agreed to do that and um, they've hit those. And But by that same token, they'd be in violation if they didn't submit it. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, so it's, it's the, a, the master development agreement, it's a catch everybody's 22. in compliance with the agreement. It's yeah, a catch-22. Right it's a yeah. binding. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and it's, it's a well-designed instrument. It's yeah, binding. Yeah, and I still, away, right? I still have no no sympathy if they miss the target because we gave them every opportunity to put a date down there that was reasonable. They took their own time. They gave us the date. It's not like we compelled them to take that date. Exactly. So um, from that standpoint, um, the idea, <laughs> Harcourt, if you're listening, the idea that you're gaining favor and by being. <laughs> In compliance, it's not going to fly. You still have to meet the dates that you put in the MDA, as far as I'm concerned, because we made an agreement, we signed it. Um, so that's that's really my message. Okay. Yep. Um, Understood. So what's coming down the road in the MDA that, uh, and I don't want to say the word compelling them to do, but what are the other targets they have to meet in the MDA before November? that would cause them to spend money or cause them to... Okay, yeah. Yeah, so Commissioner, I think the biggest one is obviously the uh, three waterfront residential units currently under construction where buildings A and B are the for, need to be happening by mid-October. And I guess what I would ask you is if they miss that by a month or two, uh, would that be a hard line for you and say you're out or would you say hey there's and this is just a straw poll not a binding binding vote But would you say oh, yeah, it's only a month or two We're gonna give you some leeway here or would you take a very hard line and say no You've had too many opportunities. You didn't perform on the granary and now you haven't performed on this uh, You've made some other things like not paying your bills in the community that have upset the community and made us look bad So we're gonna take a very hard line on this From your lips to God's ears, so we went through hell in the early days of this, and we could not get a response, and we tried to work with them, and we came to this negotiated term. Um, I'm, I have a long memory of what that was like and how much latitude we gave them in the early days of this construction project. If they're expecting latitude at the front end and latitude at the back end, uh, I'm the wrong commissioner. Throw in my two cents worth here. I don't think we should be even discussing this because they're not in violation and we're assuming a lot. We're assuming. We don't know what their plan is. They may be going to bring in a whole ton more people and equipment and do something. I don't think we should be discussing this until they're actually in violation. More power to them if that's what they choose to do. I think, I think we're getting the cart ahead of the horse here. That's my take on it. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, I would like to maybe get an update on buildings three and four compliance and what those expected date next date markers are yeah i think that's one of the things and yeah we can d definitely do that um and i think that might be something we're gonna we're working on pulling together right now actually that's one of the in this on the side what we've been working on with rob and holly just to um get a, get an idea of all the different dates um where each project's at for staff to be able to track like where is some where are different things 
right now it does look like everything's all the dates are being met i mean they met their date for submittal on this their um the neck to to, to commissioner bell's original question prior to november or october 19th which is the the date they have to have temporary occupancy for um, buildings uh, a and b which are in construction now really this was the main um next compliance date um they have submitted their uh, i guess i guess the next one would be after tomorrow 90 days to get their submittal into the city so that would be the next date so if they don't hit that that uh then i my opinion would be that they, that they're in violation or they're 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 not meeting the dates in the in the mda but there must be one for three and four yeah, right now because it's the city process yeah i mean they did they're on they that's it's in the city's hands so that's the, what we tried to build latitude was because that is what happened to, to some level of defense to Harcourt in the city's um, process, buildings A, B, and C that are under construction now have really had a hard time through permitting. And we, were, we weren't moving the end date and they were having a hard time getting through permitting. So we tried to set this process up to be like, we're gonna stay out of the city process, but there is a back end date, which has, they should have plenty of time to meet to allow all this to work through um, the, and to get through permitting and construction. But um, right now, buildings three and four, it's going as planned. Um, I think the city's a little bit slower, but not enough to like to blow up the, the, the whole overall project. Yeah. Did you have we're any more? talking about that time frame in your estimation, how much time was lost to the project due to city not doing permitting stuff? I mean, just an estimation. Bro. Yeah, I think I think um, just to begin. <laughs> Try to give everybody their due credit on this one that there was a lot it was more it was a lot of complicated they lost definitely a, a year plus of of time through the through uh, numerous faults <laughs> whether there was design changes there was a uh, lack of financing there was a whole variety of reasons for that um, I, I wouldn't put it to just on the city's permitting process no, yeah I understand that. yeah but there was some yeah, there was, yeah, there was, and you know, I think part of that is that that was the first. I'm going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to push back on that a little bit because every developer in town will tell you they lose time based on city permitting. And we gave hardcore a heads up that city permitting was going to be hard here. So, I mean, you could talk to Dawson, Ram. I mean, any builder in town will tell you that when they go in for permitting, sometimes it takes longer than expected. That's just part of the business. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, if you're sitting behind the desk of the permitting department and there's change order after change order, all of a sudden you're going to say, what's the, what's the plan? Yeah. Right. And, and where is your financing? Do you, can you make this happen? And so. there were design changes on our, I mean, there were architect, they swapped out architects, they changed design, they got more, more volume out of the, of their new design, which is great. Probably a better design overall, but there were independent decisions that were made by Harcourt that actually ended up dragging that time frame out. So. And that's good. Now yeah. we all know that. Yeah. 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 Brian, uh, kind of a, kind of global level when are we going to see many proposals that are veering away from residential we're seeing a lot of proposals that involve residential which we need housing in the community and it's important it, it definitely makes me want to make sure we're having conversations about the south parcels on the board mill for some of those flexible light industrial spaces that we've talked about in the future and trying to guide some of the other types of development you know, at one point there was an office tower that was in the mix. Haven't heard much about that. Haven't heard a ton of other um, t flavors of this development coming mm -hmm. through from Harcourt. So um, I think light industrial has a lot of potential. I think office is a really heavy lift right now. Um, Holly and Brian and I went back to Atlanta to a building that has Georgia Pacific's name all over it. And uh, what do you say, 10% of the seats were occupied? So you gotta ask yourself how long Georgia Pacific is gonna pay for a building where 90% of the building is sitting empty. And uh, I just don't see people building office anytime in the near future because Bellingham is in that exact same situation. People are working from home and they're, they're hot desking in Atlanta there. Uh, so they're sharing the same desk and it's, it's very, very low occupancy. Now the light industrial, I think there's a ton of potential there. We're seeing a lot of demand from boat builders. Uh, we're seeing demand from companies like Corvus Energy that you did the opening of yesterday. So um, I think the development will certainly shift more towards a light industrial, but I don't think you'll see an office building built in Bellingham in the near future. Do you think we'll see any of that flavor of light industrial or more flexible commercial spaces on this half of the property? 
Yeah, I think what we might see, you know, I think the alcohol plant and the adjacent parcel is going to be a really interesting discussion, and that's one that's going to be coming up on an, another separate topic. But um, I think m maybe a combination of things where we have a role in programming that is where we want to have that discussion with the commission and with staff to say, like we do at the Board Mill Hotel, I think that's a great example. We said, hey, here's a, here's a big piece that we are going to include in the, in the RFP, and we want it to be programmed, and then also bring your ideas to the table. And then it was a combination of things. It wasn't just a straight... I mean, a straight box of residential, right? Which does fit with the master development agreement and the, and the master plan documents. But when we have a hand of getting those properties back into the port control, we can do some programming, do some discussion on kind of the market analysis, what are the things we want to see down there, and put, have those put into the RFP and then have developers come with other ideas too. To be clear, we want more than what we're just getting with of these you know, kind of boxy residential uh, projects. And so that's really been a forefront of, I think, the waterfront team's uh, concern is that, yeah, how do we diversify this um, this waterfront? We want to have it to be a diverse kind of use down there, in the, even in the downtown waterfront, but also into the log pond area where we have opportunities for light industrial manufacturing, and then, of course, the marine trades area, too. So the port will have a lot more control in that. The, the master development agreement is they can propose these projects, and that's why we got uh, the developer was that they were going to propose what works and they were going to do the projects. And so we have a little less of a, of a hand in the, in the yeah. product here. Yeah. I can see we have a, a little less, you know, direction ability there, but certainly seeing that diversification of uses and the type of buildings we'll see in the future is um, a clear interest of mine. Yeah. Yeah. And there could be other things uh, that like the alcohol plant example, we've put in things like um, the potential for community space that's more different than just office or residential or retail. And so what that exactly would be, I don't know. Um, but there could be things like gyms and the, like a Y type of feel or um, other, other things like that that aren't just pure office, but they have, a, they have different elements. So, and, and I think Elliot might have mentioned this before, a market uh, that could serve portions of the, all these residences down there. So uh, not just a, like a Pike Place market, but a true grocery store type of market, but an urban feel one, like a Trader Joe's or a Whole Foods that are in an urban setting. So we're looking at all those things, and we'll be talking to the commission prior to making any decisions or putting them out for an RFP. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, there's a guy that happens to be the real estate director for the Port of Bellingham. You may, you may know him. He yeah. made the analogy that this is about the same population base by the time we're done as Point Roberts. Yeah. And when you think about the amenities that you need for a city like Point Roberts, you're going to need every single one of those amenities here, right? And the more housing that we put in and the less time we dedicate to the amenities that are going to be necessary to sustain a population of that size, the more we're shorting ourselves, I think. And, and quite frankly, the impact that we have here is going to carry upstream into the city of Bellingham. Yeah. This is, this, is, this is really revolutionary for what we're going to do for the city of Bellingham. So it, it's vital that we get this right and we have the amenities down there that we need. The other side of that is you've got $3 million condos, right, All, down to $750,000 condos, is which I think the price range is. You've got a boutique hotel. So the income level of the people who are living down there need to be, it needs to match. Right, so whatever we do with that down there, we've got to be able to accommodate the needs of that, that and it's got to match that income base. It, we've got to have some kind of transition uh, going back into the Mercy housing that somehow ties it all together. Um, and that's, that's really one of my concerns is that, you know, you, you put a bunch of high-end stuff in one corner, you might as well put a railroad track between the two of them and you can live on the other side of the tracks. But we really do need to figure out how we're going to incorporate all of that into a livable community like Point Roberts with all the amenities that come with having a city on our waterfront. Yep, agreed. Okay, any other questions or comments? I have none. Carrie, if you please. Authorize executive director to execute an authorization to proceed for Harcourt's proposed projects number five and six within the waterfront district master development area. Commissioner Bell. Thank you for your answer, Holly. Uh, I'm a yes. Commissioner Briscoe. Yes. I'm a yes as, all, as well. Curious. Okay, thanks, Commissioner. Hey, I do have one more question, Brian. Uh, I mean, we're done with the vote. But, um, <clears throat> on this project, when you brought up the backlog at the, at the city, what's the time frame you think on that? I mean, if, if the city had their staff and they were a normal permitting process, <clears throat> what, what would that time frame difference be between where they're at, they're saying they're at now? 
There, you know, I, I, the, this design step, I'm not as familiar with what they're, actually, they're being transparent about it. They put it on their permit website that they said, it was a, a little while ago, they said they're six to eight weeks behind, and that's just now been bumped up to eight to 12, or 10 to 12 weeks behind. So that's what they're projecting, and I don't know if that applies to every type of permit, but that gives you a range. They're, they're three, months. they're three, two, three months behind schedule, yeah, or capacity-wise, yeah. So I guess I would ask that we reach out to Harcourt and that we personally make them aware of that situation so that they've been made aware by us and we know it. Yep, uh, we'll do. I think that would be prudent. Yeah. Uh, are you, are my, you in agreement with that? Seems Michael. Adequate. Ken, are you in agreement no. with that? So, so Commissioner Briscoe is asking us to reach out to Harcourt to make them aware there's a two or three month delay and I'm certainly willing to do that, but shame on Harcourt if they're not aware of that and have that and ask that question themselves. No, they should have put someone here a long time ago, staff this office like we asked them to do. They haven't done that. I, I have too long a memory. I remember all of the meetings that we sat here and complained about what we can do and it wasn't until we had to threaten legal action, right? You should never have to get to that point. Well, and again, I, I contrast. Up, don't do what they did, did just so you're even. Be oh, one that, step that's ahead. not what Be we're doing. Be one step better than the guy that didn't do what he was All we're doing to is do. asking somebody to live up to the obligations that they, that they agreed to. And I will say, it's, and by contrast, what we're dealing with over at the board mill <laughs> hotel site is night and day, <clears throat> the cooperation. I don't, I don't disagree. I'm not saying they're right or wrong. I'm just saying, I believe as a port commissioner that we should take the extra step, reach out and make sure that they understand. So further down the road, if there's a discussion, we can say, hey. We'll send them a link to the city's website that talks about the delay. And I'm pretty sure we already put a hand out. Okay, I'm gonna move on to um, end of meeting public comment. Is there anyone present here? Looks like all staff. Um, anyone in Zoom, if you would wish to have public comment? Going once, going twice, gone. We'll move into other business. Commissioner Briscoe? I have none. Commissioner Bell? I have none. I just have a couple. Um, I wanted to just congratulate uh, the staff um, for a really nice event yesterday welcoming Corvus Marine um, into our community. Um, our real estate team has done a really fantastic job and I was remiss in uh, publicly recognizing the hard work that they put in uh, when I made my comments yesterday. But um, the team that I talked with in Corvus, they really called out both our economic development team and our real estate team for um, just providing a fantastic welcome to the community and connecting a whole bunch of complicated dots to bring them here um, for uh, that facility. So it was a really nice event. It was nice to have the governor, the uh, Norwegian ambassador, con uh, Congressman Larson, and um, the, a full uh, team of uh, Corvus uh, uh, CEOs and execs there as well. So nice job uh, for the team. It, it's really putting that facility to great use. Look forward to um, more opportunities for uh, you know, seeing, seeing where they go, seeing how we can expand with that uh, group. I want, I, yeah. I'd like to add to that. I apologize to staff and Corvus for not being there, but I had family issues to take care of yesterday and felt were a lot more important. So, but I, I, I appreciate, as Michael said, the staff doing what they've done. We sent the A team. I, I saw Hogan with his uh, camera. So he, he, was, he was doing some videotaping, I think. Um, uh, I wanted to also highlight tomorrow we will be at the South Hill Neighborhood Association meeting with the South Hill Neighborhood Association. Do you want time, know what time that's happening? Uh, 6.30 at the Zwanage Point Boathouse. Yes, it's at the Boathouse. Okay. House. So we'll, all three commissioners will be present with staff and the South Hill Neighborhood has been invited uh, to share any uh, questions or concerns they have with us. And so we'll be looking forward to that conversation. Um, my last one is just two quick, I don't know if they're gonna be quick, but they're both uh, related to the airport. Um, I had a question on um, two things. One, there was a recent uh, update on the firefighting foam that's used and uh, some transition. And then also when Rob and I were in uh, DC, um, we had talked with the FAA about the International Rivals Terminal and there was a question about the environmental assessment and whether that had been underway and the need, there was a little bit of confusion about the need for that to be completed as part of the package um, for 
that um, international rivals terminal would be funded. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Sunil Harmon, Director of Aviation. We'll take both of your items in the order you've asked. I've got Emily Philippi, who's going to present to you the slight forward progress that the FAA has made on the non-fluoride foam. And then Mike and I will address the issue with the FAA's inquiry on the environmental. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. Emily Philippi, Airport Operations Manager. Um, so yeah, pleased to update you guys on, um, it is a pretty significant milestone that the FAA has released with the progress of an improvements with the extinguishing agents, specifically the AFFF, which is the aqueous film forming foam. So I challenge all of you to say <laughs> that five times super fast. Um, but it has been um, kind of a long time in the making. You know, it is a FAA mandate that we do have that on all of our aircraft rescue firefighting vehicles here. Um, and it does have floor in it. So it is a forever chemical known to be hazardous to both human life as well as the environment. Um, but this has been a long time in the making. You know, it was the Reauthorization Act in 2018 that required and tasked the FAA to find a replacement for that by 2021. That date has obviously come and gone, and it was just in January um, the 12th of, um, so just a few weeks ago that they released the information, that they do have new specifications out for a replacement uh, for that. Um, but what that exactly means for us and what we can, what the future kind of holds, is it is just the specs um, for manufacturers, so that will require some additional testing. So that will then take the manufacturers, will have to submit their products um, to meet these specifications to then potentially be allowed um, on a, an approved list for airport sponsors to then be allowed to get that fluorine or yeah, the fluorine free foam, um, which is also identified as F3 is what they're calling it today. So kind of looking ahead of what, what we anticipate with that, the FAA has been transparent that it's at least a, a 90 to 120 day waiting period for that just to get um, through that testing process. Um, we have been in communication with them with some of the unknowns that we, you know, today um, we can anticipate with that. Um, is there are going to be some of those additional steps? You know, we don't know how many manufacturers can get approval um, on that. You know, what are the lead times going to be once they are approved for uh, airports to actually phys physically get that? And they have already um, let us know that they're, they do expect airport sponsors, once those are even approved, to have delays with even getting that material. Uh, so we do have kind of um, some of those uh, milestones ahead from us, but definitely a very positive step in the right direction that has been long awaited uh, uh, for a lot of airports. Um, in addition to that, um, the cost as well with uh, what these products are gonna be. And the FAA is also not requiring it at this time. Um, so it will be you know, airports as they want to um, join those on. Um, one of the additional questions, um, it sounds like in our early talks with the FAA that we don't anticipate at this time that any of our vehicles that the port currently owns would require any retrofits, but that is still uh, to be determined once the manufacturers uh, do get approved. Um, so we, again, a very positive step. We've been in contact with the FAA. We'll remain in contact with the FAA. They do know that there's gonna be some additional information forthcoming as these do get approved. Um, you know, but again, a very significant milestone, but with any major change, there's definitely, you know, gonna be some hiccups all along the way that we do anticipate, um, but uh, overall, very, very positive step within the industry. Okay, so stay tuned, it's gonna be a little while. It's gonna be a little while, yes. Or hurry up and wait. <laughs> have, have they indicated um, that they're gonna assist you in the disposal of the inventory that we have of the flooring? Correct. There's actually a statewide program with uh, EPA ongoing right now um, that they're actually going through the environmental process right now, um, but we are in constant contact with them. Um, but again, a, a large delay, but it will be a statewide program that they are instituting um, and they have offered that at no cost to the airport. 
And we have quite a significant inventory. Just in our trucks alone, there's 600 gallons, and we probably have close to 500 to 1,000 in um, additional inventory. So they'll either reimburse us or we'll have it no charge, the uh, disposal option for that? Yep, it sounds like uh, they very likely would just take it and dispose of it, yep. Huh. Okay. That's hard, Bernie. Because it's a requirement. Yeah. Well, please keep us updated. Yeah, that we will do. Okay. Thank you, Thank commissioners. You. Thank you. Uh, so, commissioners, I just wanted to add to that, that until the FAA mandates the no fluoride foam, there really isn't a market for it. Uh, the military adopting it doesn't mean it translates to civilian airports. So that lead time is probably longer than what you're thinking right now. The, the wheels of the FAA move very slowly. Um, picking up on your next question with regards to the International Arrivals Facility, and the briefing you attended, I believe, with the assistant associate deputy administrator, who's no longer there, by the way. Oh. Um, uh, she's left the FAA for another agency. Um, there wasn't a clear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a clear understanding of the scope of the project. The FAA has very specific trigger points when en environmental review is is triggered. Our project is a renovation of space that has already been dried in, has been built. There are no environmental factors that we can foresee that would precipitate. There's no additional capacity. We're not adding new gates. We're not adding additional flights. Uh, we're not adding ad additional traffic. We have a, an environmental study that enabled this terminal to be constructed based on a certain volume of activity that is supported by the runway, the terminal, and the roadway system. None of those are changed by the scope of this project. So if they insist that we do an environmental review, we can do what is called an EA, which is a very short study that leads us to a finding of no, no significant impact. But I wouldn't initiate that study until they fund the project. Remember, we're pursuing $26 million. The port has already spent about $7 million in drying in space. We have. Uh, space that is lying latent, waiting for this, this demand. Uh, the second thing is uh, the FAA's a mechanism this, of funding this billion dollars to airports over five years. Remember, we sought funds for the first time this year, which is the second year. And uh, if we don't get it this year, then we'll apply next year. Uh, but there's no hurry in trying to meet uh, her requirement for an environmental. It's on the airport layout plan. This is not a uh, port-driven program. It's an airline-driven program. We have an air carrier that wants to do international service. They sought a letter of support, which the executive director signed um, earlier, actually late last week, uh, for uh, Allegiant to work with Viva and then Allegiant to work by itself for Mexico service. So I, I don't think at this point we're at risk by, by delaying any review until we have certainty of funding. Well, it's nice to get those letters of support. That wasn't something else that came up. I think those will really help. Yes, the fact that, you know, Mike can talk to this a little bit more, but the delegation members were very helpful in, in signing the letter and submitting it to Secretary Buttigieg. There was a letter sent to the acting administrator at the FAA. Uh, we had a letter of support from uh, the SeaTac uh, authority, the port, uh, which is helpful because it does address near-term capacity needs, adding two international gates, actually modifying two domestic gates to be international gates, serves the overall system. Yeah. And, uh, so, and, and, and buying them at, a, at one tenth of what an international gate costs is, is a fairly compelling argument. So I think we're in a good place. For this. It's a great proposal. So if you feel confident that we're not going to be um, docked points on our application scoring for not having that assessment done in advance, then um, I, I won't have any other, yeah, I don't have any other uh, kind of opinion um, if you feel pretty confident with that. I'm very confident okay. that it doesn't trigger any of their requirements under the AC. Okay. Mine is just real quick. Uh, first of all, I traveled over the holidays. And what you went through um, over this holiday season was remarkable. So 
thank you for running a good airport. There was one instance where I saw Emily running by me with a roll of paper towels to go fill up something. So it, it was apparently all hands on deck because um, you had a water main break and a few, a few other incidents during the middle of this, not to mention the fact that Southwest went down uh, during that time frame. So you had a number of challenges. All of them were handled very well. And so thank you for making us look good because it's our picture up there on the wall. It's not yours. Um, but ju just giving credit where credit is due because I saw all the staff in overdrive um, going through that airport and as well as the firefighters who stayed up. I guess they have to be up, but <laughs> we're up at 2.30 in the morning when my flight came through. Mm -hmm. And it was a challenging thing. I know having gone through Denver Airport where they were packed wall-to-wall -wall people that Southwest disruption was tremendously disruptive to the system. Uh, not to Snow, mention that. Snow, ice, uh, uh, the whole, well, in, the whole in, smorgasbord. And in the airport, they were kicking around the coronavirus like a volleyball, batting it around. That's how we got it. But thank you for such a great staff, and thank you for I, being here. I think they're great staff. You've got excellent operations managers, excellent ARF personnel, and they really step up when, when things go sideways. So in terms of the snow event, I think we were closed for six hours. Um, in the entire period that we had snow, SeaTac was closed almost three days. Uh, and that's why you didn't have the Horizon flights, because uh, SeaTac wasn't accepting flights. Uh, with the, the Southwest meltdown, I, even they didn't expect that to happen. Uh, fortunately, we didn't have passengers stranded on the airport, uh, which is a good thing, because many, many of the airports had to host people for uh, days, if not a week, that's all. and that's that's tough. And the water line break, <laughs> yeah, it's almost <laughs> an annual thing now. <laughs> so we're trying to address how we can better weatherize the terminal. It might be some design or construction issue, but we're looking at how we can better insulate those those lines. There was also a fire line that um, burst. Temperatures have gotten colder when they, when it gets cold. So my last one is. Um I know you suffered a significant loss recently, and my heart goes out to you. So. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Thank thank you. Yeah. Um, any other business? Okay. We're done.